day. Thanks so much for being here. This is this is really, really great. Um, so this is a technical audience. Maybe not everybody knows what Excel is. Um, maybe not everyone knows Andre yet in that order. Um, so maybe you know just who are you and what is Excel? Sure. Happy happy to be sorry. Okay. All right. Thanks so much, everyone, for for being here. Uh, so Excel is a, is a venture capital firm. Uh, we, we do early stage investments, um, and particularly we're, we're big fans of enterprise. Uh, so among the companies we've backed, uh, we have Incubate Caldera, the, the, the major open source Apache Hadoop distribution. Um, we, we were the first investors, the only investors in Atlassian, uh, a company that um, went public earlier this year. Um, I'm sure many of you must, must be using Terra. Uh, we, uh, we, we, we were fortunate enough to back Slack three products uh, when they were still a gaming company. Um, and uh, we've also done many um, investments uh, in Europe uh, in machine learning. Um, you know, one of them being Salonis earlier this year. Uh, we've backed a company called Shift Technology, which is an uh, insurance for an analytics company out of Paris. Um, and uh, we're, we're big fans uh, of the category and uh, love seeing more and more enterprise focused companies in Germany. Thank you so much. Um, so tell us, tell us, tell us about what you mean. You know, with this, when we spoke about what could we talk about. You, I think you suggested applications versus foundational technology. What is, you know, what is that all about? What is, what's the differentiation? What do we mean? Sure. So uh, I would say, if, um, if I compare it to a couple of years ago, uh, when we started to kind of look more deeply into uh, machine learning enabled companies. Um, you know, for pretty much two years ago, as long as you would see a company with that AI uh, domain name, we would try to speak to them and learn what they're doing. Right now, uh, there's a surge of companies, uh, but kind of all there is in the stack, so we have to be way more thematic uh, in terms of how we approach uh, investing. Uh, so in terms of how we try to kind of structure the world and, and build the framework, um, we try to separate the foundational technology companies uh, which are building potentially the API layer or, or the enablers um, for applications. Uh, and then the vertical layer, which is much more industry-specific applications where you, know, you might be focusing on machine learning solutions for insurance or, or for um, you know, helping uh, disrupt HR. Um, so much more kind of commercial applications, yeah. So, I mean, the question we're supposed to answer here is it's, which will produce the first billion dollar machine learning company. And of course, as you know, we know everything. That's a joke. We don't. Um, we, we obviously don't know, but, but you know, you can probably sense from, from what you just said that you have an opinion on that. And, and your opinion is that it's more the application layer. But if we focus on, on the foundational layer for a second, you know, we're in Europe. A lot of this has happened in the US. However, you know, we at Five Ventures at least think that maybe in contrast to other things that have happened before, because of the you know strong academic link of a lot of the stuff that's been created here, we're actually not doing so bad in Europe in terms of you know some of the foundational things that, that come from here. If, if you think about a company like DeepMind that, that Google bought for I don't know exactly now, but something like five hundred million or so relatively early. So there are foundational tech companies that were created or are being created here in Europe. Um, you know, just from, you know, you guys have a perfect view on this. Actually, could you hit my machine? Thanks. Um, you, you guys have a perfect view on this as, you know, later stage investors. That's kind of weird. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I asked the question and then I'm not in between. Um, um, it's one, two, three, four. <laughs> um, where, where do you think we are in terms of, you know, an ecosystem in Europe that can at all produce like strong foundational tech companies in in AI ML? Yes, I think what's really exciting about Europe is that you have um, a lot of strong academic centers. Uh, so you have, you know, CDTM, Max Planck here in Europe, in Germany. Uh, you might have. You know, Oxbridge in the UK. So you have this constant uh, talent pipeline that's uh, you know producing a lot of smart folks. Um, I would say that the, the challenge has been that the bar has been getting higher and higher for for infrastructure technology. So, you know, so if you think, for example, uh, you know, Microsoft just earlier this month 
uh, we managed to, to beat human performance for um, transcribing, so kind of the real, uh, real time uh, transcribing speech to text. You know, if you're building like a, a voice or, or speech API machine learning company, you gotta have the confidence that you're at least on par with whatever Microsoft is building. Um, and that's harder and harder as um, you know, many of these large tech accounts are, are acquiring, many, many of the strong uh, machine learning uh, European teams. Um, so it's, it's, it's just getting harder and harder. Do, do, you, do you think there's an opportunity based on the fact that a lot of these teams you know, that were start, or companies that were started maybe three, four, five years ago, now got acquired, and, and oftentimes the large buyers not, not necessarily, you know, leave a wit AI as a wit AI as it was before, but they somehow integrate and largely use the talent on a bunch of other problems they have internally, which, you know, I don't know, but sometimes it feels like it's interesting that these early acquisitions, some early models sort of become available as an opportunity again, because sometimes, you know, some of these early companies almost disappear because they are sucked into these large organizations. Um, is that, you know, is that something you find, in? does that A, happen, and B, is that interesting? I mean, is that an opportunity where, if you want to hear the audience and you think, you know, should I start something that's more foundational, you, you can even enter fields where there are players because they're sucked into a Facebook and then don't exist anymore, post, post that question. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting perspective, I haven't thought of that. Um, I would say, just like the, from year to year, the landscape is changing a lot. Um, so probably whatever with that AI was building two years ago, is not state of the art a anymore, and um, there's a lot of you know open source uh, intelligence out there. So if you look at the you know, IngenieNet challenge, for example, you know there might be the incumbents which are um, you know putting better and better algorithms in, into a context, but you have you know, research teams from from university departments which are publicly um, you know publicly disclosing the algorithms they're using. So um, it's just, to some extent, you have to kind of always be working on the next thing rather than the same problem that uh, you know Facebook acquired for two years ago. I agree. This was probably, this was not meant to be as a hint, like oh great, just do whatever they acquire. But I think it's a funny market because we've already seen something like that before. So you know, trying to answer the question we put up here, which will produce the first billion dollar machine learning company in Europe. Um, I mean, if price or valuation or whatever that billion means is, you know, is a function of perceived value to an actual buyer, or, or you know, if you IPO this, you know, the question, or I think the underlying question probably is to, to, you know, to answer this less in a crystal ball way, is, you know, how or where can you create that that amount of value, and and I think something that you mentioned when we were preparing this a bit was like, you know, if you take a clarify. And you, and you take an IM, you know, it's kind of tricky if you think about an IM trying to disrupt maybe something that the Getty or a Shutterstock, etc. is, and you compare that with an image tagging API service, you know, but can you like lose a bit how you, how you think it's so hard to build something that's equally large in size in, in something that's, you know, the Clarify, and maybe explain what Clarify is, um, to versus sort of an IM that we just saw. Sure. So, so first of all, I think the billion dollar market is more of a catchy title. So I think the kind of the goal would be, you know, to build a, a large enduring business, uh, you know, with, with, you know, that creates value and jobs long term. Um, so I find, you know, in terms of, you know, how, how I like to look at things is, ideally you want to choose a, a large sleep incumbent, and this should not be, you know, Facebook or Google who are, you know, highly aggressive in this. You know, this should be. Um, you know, company like uh, Orcat or um, you know, get the images you, you, you mentioned, or pretty much any uh, you know any kind of company that was founded in the '80s and somehow still happens to be listed on the Nasdaq. Um, so, and, and if you see it as such a large multi-billion company that does not have state-of-the-art technology, um, you know, try to go after their market with a much better kind of data enabled solution. So, you know, in the, in the example you brought up. You know, Clarify is, uh, is providing the um, kind of the image tagging and the, the, the enabling layer, um, and you know other other providers are, are trying to build that as well. And um, you know, every year the kind of 
niche tagging is becoming more and more uh, state of the art. You know, so right now, as of two years ago, image tagging is done much better by a machine rather than a, than a human. So, you know, I tend to like much more models where you're trying to use the best state of the art technology out there, whether it's built internally using open source or using you know, API providers like Clarify, and going after a large incumbent where you know exactly how big the market is, you know, who the customers are and how much they're paying, uh, and try to win those customers away uh, from the incumbent. I mean, you know, I don't know, but there might also be another element to that, right? That if you think about your, your image tagging or, or classification example, if, if you know, every two years we see other things performing so much better, it's probably also very hard to build a defensible API business, right? When there's like the world of research you, is your competent is, is sort of your competitor, right? <coughs> is, this a, is this a totally different ball game versus maybe other kinds of you know things we see, we've seen before, where in AV tech was like a small group of people working on it. So yeah, maybe, maybe it's just something that's also very hard to stay on top for a long, long period of time. And I think one thing is for sure, right? Very very large companies also typically have to have something that's you know strong and defensible over extended period of time, and they don't have that. Yeah, and I that is, you know, sometimes I find doing really well, it's not a matter of you working really hard, which is just take that as given, but it's also a matter of having competition that's just much worse than you. So I find you trying to beat all the engineers at Facebook and all the research departments at the top 20 universities in the US or in, in Europe, I think it's very different than trying to beat a, a back office at a kind of legal software provider, um, you know, that, that, that can already hire you know, good talent. So now for the people in the audience who think about starting something like this or think about joining a company um, you know, as, as some degree of guideline, are the areas that you think are particularly interesting in, in the application side of things and <coughs> industries or things where you see like, mm, interesting, why haven't we seen something happening there or we're just starting to see the first companies in something that we oftentimes refer to as that, that portfolio company you mentioned earlier, Shift Technologies, right, that, that is taking a pretty awesome approach on, on covering insurance fraud. Um, and, and that's probably also an industry that in many ways is, is structurally ready to do these kind of things from, from the data they have, etc. But I'm sure there's much more you see or what else in terms of sectors or so that do you find interesting? So I'm really excited right now about professional services, um, so of all kinds, but actually uh, more on the kind of white collar side. So legal, in the, the legal industry is a perfect example where, you know, if you look at the size of the, the legal industry overall, you know, you can find many numbers, but let's say it's in the hundreds of billions of dollars, but that's mostly services, uh, so law firms. And, and if you look at legal tech, so software for legal firms, it's like a two, three billion market. So it's much smaller, it's like one percent. Um, and it, it makes you think that the, the, the vendors, the, the legal software industry, kind of the Gen 1, were basically enablers for these law firms. Uh, but that's, that's, that's just kind of straight the service and I find the next generation of AI-enabled software uh, would much more replace uh, lawyers rather than empower them. Or, um, kind of replace the road tasks where lawyers have to do uh, and help lawyers become much more you know, project managers or, or orchestrators of various technologies. Um, so you know, areas like uh, document management or you know, kind of extracting information from documents or, or areas where you're doing kind of e-discovery, you know, helping, um, you know, leveraging tools to, to help you Go through the you know thousands of data sources out there, emails and so on to 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 find you know the proof or you know the false are in case or, or, or whatever. Um, so I think that that's really powerful. Um, and the same can be applied to to consulting or um, you know even in banking. Um, so the many many professional services industry I find um, are overstaffed and, and have business models which are not uh, not, not sustainable. Uh, so I think machine learning can have a large impact in, uh, in disrupting these. So I'm sure we could go on for a bit until you all fall asleep. Um, but you guys should have the opportunity to just ask questions, ask anything you want. Um, 
it's a rare opportunity to ask someone from Excel all the great things they see. They do see all the great things. So, we try it. Hi, my name is Arshia Gracio, and I'm from the UK. It's the land of DeepMind and uh, Magic Pony. Um, so I have an automotive uh, uh, startup. Sorry, I've had one too many, so I'm going to start story. So apologies for that. And what I find is that, so we're working in the space of machine learning. We're trying to make intelligent applications. And what we find is even though we're not creating that foundational AI, and I spent a lot of time actually talking to people because I was under this impression I had to have these shit hot scientists on board and stuff. What, what I've been told is what you can actually do with it. So oftentimes what you were quoting right now about the, the legal profession, it's about having that, that AI which is able to recognize some words and be able to um, create sense out of that, right? So that's foundational, but the application is in the legal profession. That's right, and then you tailor the application for that. Right, so how do you feel about manufacturing? How do you feel about the automotive space where you've got all this big data that's being generated and there isn't any infrastructure or framework in place to be able to make context of that. Would Axel invest in companies like mine? And we're hiring, just saying. <laughs> yes, I, I would say, I mean, for obvious reasons, there's a lot happening in, or, in the automotive industry right now. Um, I think the kind of one big difference, for example, to the legal industry is that um, the range of, of customers is much more concentrated. Um, so, you know, we always try to kind of think backwards uh, in terms of, hey, you know, who would buy this company or who, you know, how could you take this company public? And that's very hard to happen to say if you're serving 20 large automakers. Um, so it's, you know, either you're building your own kind of full stack automotive company or you're trying to find a way where, you know, your, your destiny doesn't depend on, you know, Audi. Daimler and a couple of other companies. But again, it, it, it's hard for me to understand just from two minutes what you're describing, so. Yeah, Happy to tell her. Come on guys, don't be shy. Hi, my name is Oliver and my question is, um, do you think that the uh, um, legislative limits on data collection in Europe, or especially in Germany, um, affect the ability of machine learning companies to, to create their tech? Yes, yeah, so I think that's a, that's a great question. Um, I would say, uh, and he has one impact. So, so first of all, I think a lot of enterprises, if you go to Siemens, for example, um, if you crunch their accounting data or legal data, you can already train a, you know, an algorithm just based on internal data. Um, so, <coughs> so I think that, that problem to some extent is, um, is not that large. I think what's, um, what's an issue when you host all these algorithms on premise is that you, you um, forego the benefits of training your algorithm on a large base of customers and then kind of aggregating the insights and in using those to serve the next customer. Um, but I, I think insofar as you're kind of going after a large enterprise tier um, with an on-premise solution where you can cater to their needs, I think uh, that's still doable. I, mean, I think it's like also really, really depends on a different industry by industry basis, right? So like in, in marketing tech where a lot of this stuff was used probably earlier than in any other industry, I'm sure with everything that's happening in Europe and happening in Europe the next year or so, yeah, you'll see less of this. But like, in, I think in a large insurance company that has large, vast data pools, you know, I mean, it's, it's an internal game anyhow, so I don't think they are really limited by, they probably have, they, they probably simply have too much data internally than, than too little, so I don't think, I don't think you, you should be afraid that you're limited in not being able to build a large company in Europe to sum it up. It's not a good excuse. Just kidding. What else? Anybody else? Over there? So, how about the market fragmentation in Europe? Then, when we also have a problem here, like there are so many countries and so many languages. And on the other side, uh, US, uh, there's like 300 million people who speak the same language or in China. 
India and how do you come to that? Yeah, I, I think that's always a challenge I would say. It also comes to the advantage, the advantage that building a very strong R&D team is much more affordable in Europe. So if you look at the, at the stage where we, where we invest, we tend to back you know, companies with very strong R&D and you know, some product market fit in Europe. But then it's all about scaling in the US. You know, so in terms of building a large enterprise software company, you have to serve the US. Um, so I, I think you can kind of dissociate the two problems, still build your team here, here but really orient the sales and marketing efforts for the US. But to that, again, as a slightly smaller fund, um, you know, slightly. Um, I mean, you can build an amazing, great company that you, you can be, that, that is a great, great outcome for you and your investors without having to build a global company, right? So um, I don't think, I don't think you're really limited in building something amazing here. Sometimes some of these things are a bit more tricky for some companies like an IM, I am. I would assume it matters slightly less because, you know, it's an app, it's photography, the places where people do it. It's probably not something like, oh, the Germans do it, but but the Swiss won't. Or the Swiss, that's special, but, you know, they won't. <laughs> it. Um, so, so I think it really depends on what you choose. And, and, and then some other models, it's obviously much more difficult to scale pan EU because you need to live up to you know different types of regulation. So but I think you can also make smart conscious decisions when you start the company in, 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 in working on something where this will be slightly less of an issue. Or you can also make conscious decisions where you do something like this, you know, and maybe that's not an Excel case then, but it's it still can be a you know a couple of hundred million euro company easily where you build something where you you know you, you demonstrate that you can do something exciting in Europe in Europe and part of your defense, defensibility is that a large US player will stay in the US for a long time. I mean it, it depends. I just the only thing I'm saying is I don't think there's like a one clear answer and now we have to be afraid because the only the large stuff will only come from the US. And I think again sort of to you know make us Germans are always so great at, at talking badly about themselves. Um, to make us feel slightly better about this, I think in, in this whole ML world, maybe in contrast you know, to what happened in mobile initially or so, I think we're actually in a pretty exciting position in Europe in terms of talent, right? Because right now this is still a, is a, it's still a function of talent. There's probably a group of, I've heard and, and someone from DeepMind say that when they monitor other companies in Europe that start that field, they have like an internal list of, of something like 200 people and if none of these two, no, no one in, in the founding team is on that list of 200 people, they kind of put it into the we don't care basket. Because they say like, okay, it's, you know, these people exist in Europe um, and, and talent is scarce, it always is scarce, but maybe in different contrast to you know, other, other technological waves, some of this talent is, is available in Europe. So you should be pretty <coughs> It's just sad to that. So I, I totally agree with Gabe in that um, you know, it really depends on the distribution model. So if, you know, if it's an app, it's very different than like a semi software versus enterprise. But it's just kind of sticking to the enterprise example. Let's say if you build a, a very large business just in, in Germany alone, I think it will be equally hard or almost equally hard to uh, launch the UK versus launch in the US. Uh, and I, you know, I think you should just go after the US where the price is bigger. Um, yeah. More questions? Come on. I'm sure there's at least one more question. <laughs> well, we were just discussing on this topic where to start, and uh, if you look at the B2C industries, like uh, consumers, um, I think one can say that US is pretty mature and you also have a really big customer base and they are, uh, if you were able to serve them, you are basically able to serve a lot of different countries. So do you think it's a good decision if you go for B2C to start in, in Europe? Yes, I'd say for B2C, uh, so I think there's one, um, there's one thing about B2C in Europe is that Sometimes the markets in Europe are actually large enough. So, you know, with bad companies like Deliveroo or Blah Blah Car, uh, you know, in, in the kind of sharing economy, and they're not 
going to the US at all because it's just much more competitive. So they'd rather go, you know, for example, to India or Singapore or Australia, where it's much more of a green opportunity. So, but in, in this case, those pools are still large enough. You know, so I think the because you have, you, have, you, have to, you actually can afford to avoid the US uh, going after large enough markets which are much less competitive, versus an enterprise, most markets outside of the US are just not as big. Okay. Uh, but well, if I identify a few strides to uh, really build a global company, for example, is it good to start in Europe or maybe it's even better to start in the US? Yeah, I think it's just very hard. I think you should definitely use the advantage of having a European heritage around kind of building a team here. Um, you know, especially just given the hiring challenges over there. But, but I mean, on that, you know, if you want to build a global company, the answer is not uh, where do I have to best start it. I think the answer is, you know, go and build a global company. And what that means is, you know, is it means not limiting yourself to if you would have started a dump smash and I'm you know I'm not an investor and I probably would have never been, but they did their first demo at the tech meetup and signed up users number 35 to I think 46 here, uh, which is kind of fun. But if something like that you you would start and you'd be like, no, but we're going to do Germany only. Yeah, that's probably not going to work. So if you want to build something like that, that's extreme consumer, right? I think the answer is just trying to be global from day one. And I think the cool thing is with stuff like this, I think it's very hard and I, don't, I also think it's, there's a lot of luck in starting these kind of companies. But, but I think, again, just force yourself to build it as a global company from day one. Approach everything that you do, see it internationally, all of these things, just make it international, make it global from early on. Then, then, then I don't think it really matters the way you do it. Thanks. You can come talk to us if you have something in mind already. First to me, and then later to him. <laughs> Alright, before you all fall asleep, and before we die and melt up here, it's like a thousand degrees on this stage, um, thanks so much for your questions, thanks so much for coming. Um, do help us improve, if you have feedback or stuff you want to do, or if you want to do a demo next time yourself, just put, put some feedback up on 